individual personal purpose is to try to make a positive difference on people around me and then to use the platform I have to make a positive difference in the world. And note that, uh, you know, this is an evergreen purpose, meaning whereas, whether I'm the CEO of Best Buy or starting my next chapter, it's uh, always true. It stems from a reflection on uh, what, is, what is work, right? Because, of course, uh, work is a big part of our life. And uh, you can see work as a curse, as a punishment, because we sinned in paradise. I tend to see work as being essential to our humanity and to our fulfillment. It's part of our quest for meaning. So it's not something you do so, th so that you can do something else. It's something that's essential to, uh, to our lives. And I think it's essential that then when we lead companies, we recognize this uh, for all of the people working at the company and we can connect their individual purpose. <laughs> I think these days, most companies, most leaders believe in the importance of purpose. Uh, and the question is often, so where do you start? What, how do you sequence? Uh, and the logical part of our mind would have us start with purpose, then derive the strategy, you know, anchor it in purpose, and then transform the organization on that basis. My personal experience is actually different. When we studied the turnaround, I was very clear that about my philosophy, which was, you know, our purpose Profit is not the purpose, the purpose is to contribute to the common good, but we did not spend time in the first three years of the turnaround on refining our purpose. We spent the time on saving you know, the ship that was sinking. We didn't start with purpose. We spent a lot of time, uh, uh, and you know, I can see that very clearly with hindsight, on making sure that the soil of the company was fertile. You know, you know the parable of the sower. If the seeds fall on stones, nothing is going to happen. You, you, you may have perfect seeds, but it's not going to grow. And so creating an environment, a very human environment, where people felt that they belonged, that it was a human organization, that we emphasized individual development and creating a, a joyous, growth-oriented you know, culture, was a lot of our emphasis. So the sequence of steps is not always going to be start with purpose. A lot of companies are focused on that, but it may not be the best place um, uh, of attack. So when, when you're going to start working on defining the, the purpose, um, the danger is to make it abstract, uh, too glossy, you know, for the, for the website, it's like the, you know, the company values and mission or you know, uh, statement or vision. Um, no, it needs to be grounded and uh, grounded in true, true customer needs, a true demonstrated ability, strategic competitive advantage, of course, your dream, but also the ability to make money. So this is something that's very real and tangible and is tightly connected to, you know, the, the, the growth engine and the profit engine of the, uh, of the, uh, of the company. So the danger of the uh, the fact that purpose is very much en vogue is to put too much, em paradoxically, is to put too, ma too much emphasis too early on it, um, as opposed to maybe finding the right time and the right approach to uh, go after this. You know, there's a risk if the definition of purpose is too much for the website. People say, well, that's not my reality. So how do we make it real? And how do we unleash that human potential? I think uh, one of the reasons why I'm excited is that there's so much more to be invented. This is a very promising time in many ways. In a turnaround, typically people tell you, you know, cut, cut, cut. And my approach to turnaround is essentially the opposite. It's to actually start with people. And so my first week on the job, I spent uh, in, a, in a handful of stores, starting in the store in St. Cloud, Minnesota, to listen to the frontliners and learn from, from them what was happening. That's how we also decided to invest in the shopping experience online. We invest in the speed of delivery to neutralize you know, the advantage of online uh, players. We also invested uh, in the store experience. Uh, we partnered with, decided to partner with the, the world's foremost tech companies. That's when we have developed all of these stores within the stores. On the cost side, we didn't start with headcount. We finished with headcount. We started by 
looking at how we could attack non-salary expenses, then you go to headcount as a last resort. And by the way, you don't start with the frontliners, you start with the top uh, uh, of, the, of the house. So in short eight weeks, we constructed a plan that we called Renew Blue. Uh, and we didn't go for perfection, but we co-created it. Uh, and then we got the bicycle going in a turnaround, creating momentum and energy. As you lead these turnarounds, you have to engage all of the stakeholders. Start with the employees, the, you focus on the customers. In our case, we leverage the, uh, the, the vendors. And note, by the way, when we presented our invest our plan, our Renew plan, Renew Blue plan to our investors, it had all of the stakeholders, right? Customers, employees, vendor partners, community, and shareholders. And as relates to the shareholders, our approach was very simple. We 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 shared with them uh, on, on the, in November 2012 in New York our diagnosis, our strengths, and as well as our opportunities. We were very transparent. We gave them the overall framework. Uh, and our long-term targets. I don't think you impress shareholders just by the words you, <laughs> you use, you know, but it's more around the say-do ratio. So in the following quarters, we really focused on doing what we had said we were gonna do and reporting quarterly progress and showing them the very concrete opportunities and then uh, demonstrating how we had gone after them. That allowed us to build our credibility and so sometimes there is a, uh, a debate about, as a company, do you need to focus on the short term or the long term? And do shareholders force you to do crazy things because of a short term focus? I think that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a wrong debate. I'm a big believer that 98% of the questions that are asked as either or are better answered as and. Uh, of course, you need to focus on the long term and you need to focus on the short term. It's the same in our personal lives. Uh, you have to live in the moment. Uh, but delivering quarter after quarter progress uh, was very helpful. I've also always found that if you tell the investors, look, I'm going to be investing in this area and the payback is going to look like this, they're very open to understanding that. They, you know, they want you to create long-term value. And so if you're logical and you follow through and you have a track record of delivering, they're very open to this. So any uh, management team that, you know, relies on, you know, excuses related to the shareholders, I think is, uh, is misdirected. As we did to the customers, uh, it's very simple. When we did the, the market research, what we saw is that, uh, you know, many of us love technology, right? We, there's a lot of exciting new products, exciting things that we can do with technology. The challenge many of us have, self-included, is that uh, it's complicated, it's, it can be confusing, so we need help as customers. And so the purpose of, uh, of Best Buy as relates to customers is not actually just to sell you a TV or a computer, even though if you want to buy one, we'll gladly help you, but it goes beyond that. It's about what we call enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs. So the reason why people buy a computer or a phone, you know, it's not really for the product, it's for what you can do. And by focusing on the underlying human needs, for us, it unleashed a lot of growth opportunities, uh, such as, for example, our opportunity to go, or our strategy to go after the health uh, segments. Uh, health is an important need, as we all know, during this COVID crisis. And by help, you know, our strategy is to help aging seniors live in their, lo in their home ind independently longer by putting sensors in their, in their home, under the bed, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, uh, on themselves for fall detection. And through remote monitoring and artificial intelligence, you know, we can help detect whether something is going wrong uh, and, and trigger an intervention. So that's a real need. And note how the strategy is not focused on you know, the fact that we have brick and mortar or that we are retail, it's based on addressing human needs. So that was the first part. Interestingly enough, we have a second purpose, which is to help uh, the, the world's foremost tech companies uh, commercialize the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investments. So it's not about showrooming, it's about showcasing 
the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment and helping customers understand what can be done with that. And it's been a critical element of our journey, um, of our purpose and of our economic equation. One thing I want to add as relates to, you know, this uh, purpose focus and leaning with a focus on purpose and humanity is what it means from a leadership standpoint. Uh, and maybe the first thing is, is to beware of, you know, what drives you as a leader. If what drives you is, if you're driven by power, fame, glory, or money, uh, this is a danger zone. Be clear about, you know, what is your purpose as a leader? What is the purpose of people around you? And how all of this connects with the purpose of the company. Be clear about your role as a leader, meaning it's not to be the smartest person in the room and to make sure that everybody knows around you how smart you are. It's to create an environment in which others can be successful. And so that's, I think, the kind of leader that, uh, that we need. Uh, it's, a, it's a leader that leads with all of their body parts. They lead, of course, with their brain, nothing wrong with having a brain, but also their heart, their soul, and also their guts using, especially in, in a crisis like we had at the time and that we have today with COVID, uh, using your, your instincts and your intuition is also important. So use all of your body parts. And perfection, I think, is very dangerous because, you know, you, you work on a team and on your team, you have other human beings. And guess what? They're not perfect. They're making mistakes. And being able to say, my name is Hubert and I need help, you know, is a good <laughs> exercise that, uh, you know, create a much better, uh, much better outcome. So you know, in this COVID crisis in particular, I've seen a lot of leaders being okay by with saying, all right, this is what I know. This is what we know at this point. This is what we don't know. This is the work we're doing to figure out, you know, the answers to this we don't know question, but not feeling the need to have answers to all of the questions and giving the impression that uh, no mistake is being made. In fact, I think any leader knows that creating an environment in which it's okay to make mistakes uh, is, uh, of course, that's, that's something that makes complete sense. So I think I would say beware about the concept of perfection and embrace vulnerabilities.